thank you for coming to this session. Uh, thank you for sticking around for the last session. I know it's you know kind of late. Uh, so we're excited to be here at KubeCon and to tell you about uh, multi-tenancy, uh, about Nabla and Kata containers. A uh, little bit about ourselves. So I'm Rico and I work at Branch Metrics doing cloud operations and I'm a Kata containers contributor. And I'm James, I work for IBM and IBM Research. I'm primarily a kernel developer, so I work on the low-level nuts and bolts of container technology, which is why I'll be talking about most of the non-Kubernetes pieces of what goes on with Nabla. Great, so briefly, what we do at Branch, we run containers everywhere. Uh, we run Kubernetes in all kinds of environments, QA development and production, serving API services in all kinds of different languages. We also run Mesos, uh, some of our data pipelines run, some, run on top of Mesos, uh, Spark, Flink, and Druid type of applications. Our main runtime is Docker, we run C and Container D. Uh, we're looking at some other ones. And there's still some big data and database type of stateful applications that we haven't gotten around to containerize yet. Uh, we, we still think that they're not quite ready for some of the, the stateful type of applications. Uh, so briefly, uh, what we're gonna be talking about today, so why regular containers are kinda harder, or they're hard to have security implemented on them, and a little bit on Kata, and uh, the what's and why's, and a little bit of containers in V2, which is a new feature in Kata containers. Then we'll talk about Nabla, also um, uh, what's and why, and some about horizontal, Attack Profile, it's a metric developed at uh, IBM. And we'll talk about Kubernetes and how you can run these runtimes with Containerd and Cryo and using the runtime class, which uh, became available in Kubernetes 112. And then we'll talk about the future in terms of workloads and also in terms of features, maybe hot plug uh, for some of these container runtimes, and maybe some type of workloads that you can run, such as uh, AI and machine learning. So traditional containers, uh, you've probably seen this slide um, a few times, so you have a regular kernel uh, on top of your hardware, and you may have a virtual machine or you may not have a virtual machine, but the thing with traditional containers is that they share that kernel, right? So if you uh, uh, run a container and it's compromised and w through a system call, then uh, your other containers might be compromised, so your host kernel gets compromised and everything in, in, on, on that particular node might get compromised. And then, so you, as you can see in this diagram, so um, you have a, uh, something going wrong with one of the containers and then it compromises your, your kernel. So if you can see that Linux kernel has over 300 system calls, uh, so every system call makes it possible for a point of attack, right? So it, common sense says that if you have less of these system calls available, you have less potential vulnerabilities. Then if you look at the Docker seccom default profile, uh, you see that it only uh, blocks about 44 system calls. So there's still about 280 system calls available. Right? So, and it's really hard to create a very generic seccom profile. So it's, uh, to, and then you can create some for very specific applications, but it, it becomes really difficult. So as you can see, the default seccom profile has uh, and, and Docker has uh, 1,578 lines, so it um, becomes you know, time tedious and uh, difficult to figure out uh, for me. I mean, uh, but if you're an expert, maybe, but, but for regular people, it might be difficult. And then there's Linux capabilities. So there's 39 of them, and as you can see, each one of them has this unique way of, of isolating or, or doing different things at the Linux kernel level. Uh, so it would take a lot of time for you to understand. Or you can try JZ for sales, uh, contain.af game, and learn a little bit more about Linux capabilities. Uh, but then again, it will take you, uh, you know, time to figure out. Another approach that a lot of people use is using SE Linux uh, to uh, contain more of uh, uh, whatever workloads are running on your system. Uh, but then you have to create a base, uh, compile a base module, and, and it becomes kind of difficult to uh, 
get it enabled. And so uh, to me, this is kind of what SQLinux looks like. You have all these different options. So it's like a galaxy of and the stars are all the kind of, all the different options. Um, so what do most people do? They actually disable SQLinux. So like, but don't let Dan Walsh hear us, hear us say that, right? Don't repeat this. <laughs> yeah. This is what you do, not what you say. <laughs> exactly. So another approach is using App Armor, and similarly to SQ Linux, uh, you have to enable it at the Linux kernel, and you know you have to boot up with App Armor. And I don't know if a lot of people use it, to be honest. Uh, so to me, it's like that makes me have a headache, right? So it's like, oh my god, all these different options. So okay, got a containers, right? Uh, so uh, you see that the difference here is that you have a Linux kernel and you have a virtual machine and in that virtual machine you're running your container. So that virtual machine has its own unique kernel, uh, Kata Containers has a, this lightweight kernel and uh, on top of that you have your application. So if you, something goes wrong with that Linux kernel, the, other, the host Linux kernel doesn't get compromised and the other Linux kernels don't get compromised either. On the, for the other containers. So you can see the Kata has a trade-off between you know, uh, being fast and uh, isolation, so it's not quite as fast as a regular container. Uh, but if you have regular containers, you, I mean, if you have a setcom profile, it slows down your container, but, but, but you know, the way most people run regular containers, it's, not as, it's actually faster than running Kata containers. And it's not as slow as a regular virtual machine because it's a lightweight, lightweight kernel and it's a lightweight virtual machine. So requirements for Kata containers, either bare metal or, or nested virtualization, obviously running on Linux. Uh, you can use uh, public cloud providers like GCP or Azure, but they support nested virtualization. They don't have bare metal offerings right now. With AWS, you can use i3 metal instances and you can also use i5 metal instances that are in the works. And for private cloud, you can run it with anything with OpenStack, or you can use uh, bare, anything bare metal or that supports virtual, uh, nested virtualization. And of course, for platform, uh, anything Kubernetes with, uh, to orchestrate your workloads with, with Cryo or ContainerD, or you can also use plain Docker. When you first install uh, Kata containers, you can just run this utility, Kata Runtime, Kata Check, and then it'll tell you uh, whether you can run Kata containers on that host or not. And if you run, want to run with Kubernetes, you can use this Kata Deploy uh, uh, utility in GitHub and automatically install uh, Kata containers on all of your nodes. Or you can follow the Kata installation guide. Likewise, with Docker, you can also follow your Kata installation guide on GitHub. So container is in V2. So the problem with uh, Kata containers is that you have a lot of processes. You have a Kata shim, you have a, have a Kata proxy, you have a Kata agent inside the VM. So what container shim v2 does is uh, it allows you to uh, just have a single process per pod. And that container shim uh, will handle the I.O. as opposed to this Kata shim process. And then you will not have a Kata proxy if you use this VSOC support that became available in 1.1 or 1.2. And then also, uh, the Kata CLI doesn't need to be run C compatible. So this is what it looks like with container shim v2 before. Uh, you, have, you see you have a lot of processes. You have a kind of container uh, d shim for every single container in a pod. And then also you have a kata shim for every single container in a pod going through a proxy. And then you, you see that you need a shim for your kata agent and then a shim for every single container in your pod. So after, you see that it got simplified a lot more uh, so this will be available in 1.5. And so you have a, a container shim v2, and then that's handling the IO, it's communicating with every container in the pod, and also communicating with the agent. So Nabla containers. Over to me, Nabla containers. Well, since we only actually have one working clicker, you can do the countdown timing for me. Um, so as you heard, uh, one of the ways you can actually improve your container experience in terms of security is by minimizing the amount of uh, kernel surface you actually expose to the system calls. 
So part of what um, Nabla Containers was based on was the idea somewhat similar to what GVisor does, that if you can take parts of the kernel up here, I suppose I should do it over there for you people as, as well, um, you can actually move some parts of the system call from their natural place in the Linux kernel up into this what's called the Nabla Tender, which is basically a unikernel-like lib operating system thing, and do emulation. GVisor is doing almost exactly the same thing. The only real difference between GVisor and unikernels is that unikernels are existing technology, hopefully with more of the bugs worked out, that we actually repurpose for running inside a container as a library operating system. Um, GVisor is exactly the same thing, except it's a new thing written in Go. And as we all know, the main problems with new code is security people keep saying is, the more new stuff you write, the more bugs you actually put into the code. So all code goes through this sort of exponential decay curve where the most number of bugs sit in the code at the instant it's released by the developers, and they go down over time as more bugs are found. Um, so using an existing library OS kernel, we can actually hopefully take something that is slightly more in the middle of that bug cycle than at the end and emulate most of the system calls. And what this means is at the bottom of um, Nabla containers, we actually have only seven system calls that we actually project into the Linux kernel. So we've reduced the system call surface from the huge 300 all the way down to seven. And we can actually experimentally prove that this gives us a much better what's called horizontal attack profile of uh, the Linux kernel. So an attack profile is basically the number of lines of code you traverse multiplied by the bug density of that code. And that gives you a number that corresponds to the insecurity of your, of your pr uh, thing, whatever you're running. The higher this number, the more insecure you are. Uh, horizontal attack profile is where you actually hit the common shared components of the system, and you have to do a traversal path through them down and up to actually get whatever effect you're trying to do in your web server to function. And the reason horizontal is the problematic one is because it's a shared component, if the user can come down and hit an exploit in the shared component, they can use that to compromise the entire physical system. Remember, Rico told you that the kernel is actually shared amongst all containers on a bare metal system, if that's what you actually do. Um, so the thing that um, we actually measure with the horizontal attack profile is the portion of the kernel that you're actually exploitable as you come through the system. And obviously, every system call on this diagram is inside the kernel, so it represents a potential horizontal exploit. So these 300 system calls in an ordinary container contribute fairly enormously to your horizontal attack profile. Just reducing it to seven system calls effectively reduces your horizontal attack profile by pretty much um, uh, 50 times, which we can actually show somewhat in the measurements. So the way it's constructed, as I said, is, um, so if you went to Justin Cormack's talk, he told you that all code has to be modified for unikernels because it's linked with the library operating system. This is actually untrue, but the reason it's untrue is because most of you in this room like what are called web languages. Web languages run on top of an interpreter. So the way we get your web languages to work is that we modify the interpreter's link with the unikernel, but your web language stuff goes on top of it. So we can run Node.js, Redis, Nginx code, all of that can actually be run unmodified inside the uh, unikernel tender. But if you wanted to run something like a vanilla C program, that would have to be modified. And fortunately, very few web programmers today actually write C code. So most of the code you write will actually run unmodified inside Nabla. Then we use this thing called Rump Run, which is effectively a NetBSD kernel. Um, that actually does the glue layer that gets you between the application and the sort of solo five and the tender. And the tender is the thing that sits at the bottom and actually translates what solo five does down into what the Linux kernel expects. And the reason we need this tender thing is because we're running these things as pure containers. There is no virtualization layer underneath. And Rump Run and the NetBSD expect to be run on top of a virtual machine. So the tender converts from a virtual machine into the Linux system calls. And this gives us the ability to run this thing purely inside a container. And uh, obviously, Nabla's requirements are pretty much the same as almost any other uh, 
environment. So we can run, and we ideally would run on regular bare metal. Obviously, the operating system should be Linux. But one of the interesting things about Nabla is that actually, because we only use seven system calls, and they're pretty generic system calls, almost any POSIX thing can actually run on them. So in theory, Nabla will run your applications unmodified on a Windows machine as well, just using these seven system calls from the Windows POSIX interface. And something I didn't even consider, because basically, nowadays, everybody at this conference pretty much recognizes that Linux is almost the universality of the cloud. But coming from IBM, I did get one of the AIX guys to sidle up to me and say, would this system actually work on AIX as well? And the answer is absolutely, of course. There's no reason it has to be Linux kernel underneath there. As long as you can supply these seven system calls, it can actually be an AIX kernel. And then I said, AIX is still a thing? And he said, oh, yeah, because he's part of the AIX group. But the point is that we can use this narrowness of the system call interface to get some universality here. We can probably run on more things than Linux. And obviously, then we can run on any public cloud, because almost every public cloud is Linux or provides Linux interfaces if it's Azure. We can run on almost all the private clouds, and we can run on almost all of the platforms, provided the Kubernetes thing has been modified with the runtime class, which Rico will actually talk about later. The requirements we currently have for Nabla are this thing called run NC, because every different runtime currently has a different run C. So we've got run NC for run Nabla containers. Uh, Gvisor has run SC for their run secure containers and so on. But once we actually get the runtime class, we can actually run them all in a standard way. And obviously, we can run them with Docker as well, just using the particular runtime specifier, as long as you've got the Docker version that actually accepts run C. So side-by-side -side comparison. We can do this together. These are some of the metrics that we actually did. This is somewhat of a repetition of what you saw in the previous talk. Uh, these are actually throughput metrics. And the red at the top is pure Docker. This is all running on bare metal. So I didn't look at any virtualization penalties here, which is the most interesting use case. And the Docker one is the bare metal one that we're all chasing. It's the high result, so Docker on bare metal. As you can see, uh, the two Gvisor results are actually sitting down here. And that mirrors pretty much what was seen in the last performance talk. Gvisor's performance, particularly on benchmarks like Redis Get Set, Python Tornado, Node Express, is not terribly good. We actually have done the uh, differential between this is actually the uh, Ptrace Gvisor, and this is the KVM Gvisor. So as you can see, if you have a significant system call penalty, Ptrace is uh, loses you a lot more performance than actually trying to do the KVM interface does. Um, then you can actually see CATA containers here in all of these. So by and large, the difference between CATA and Docker is not that high, which is sort of pretty much also what the previous talks told you. And then for Nabla containers, um, Nabla raw is actually running it in the KVM-like interface. Nabla container is actually running it through the standard uh, tenderized container interfaces. And again, the performance penalty is something, but it's not as much as sort of uh, factors of uh, two or three. It's down in the percentile regions for almost all of these throughput tests. Um, so I described a bit what horizontal attack profile was. But basically, it's an attempt to measure security in any system. So this, this measure doesn't just work for Nabla. It works for almost any system that claims to have security. What it's looking for is to ask, how much code does the system run through? And multiply that by the bug density in the code and come up with a number corresponding to what your vulnerability potentially is. And then the horizontal piece of it looks at what your vulnerability is and the shared piece that would actually give you a security violation, which would effectively be a containment breach. Um, it was done by IBM Research because I got pretty tired. I've been in containers a long time, in the low level of them, and we've had endless arguments with hypervisor people about are containers secure or are containers not secure. In the early days, IBM Bluemix, which is the old IBM cloud, was the world's first actually container bare metal cloud, which meant your containers were not running on a virtual machine. They were actually running on native bare metal. It was actually built using um, uh, the uh, OpenStack uh, Docker Nova interface, which is something that really doesn't exist nowadays. Uh, so nowadays, we're all about Kubernetes and the cloud. But in those early days, we were about Docker. 
Um, but the point is that a bare metal cloud actually gives you far more performance and control than almost anything else. So as Justin was saying in his talk previously, bare metal containers are the things we all want to aim for. So IBM initially aimed at them first, but um, everybody gets frightened by the fact that we have these problems with horizontal containment. And forcing customers to use virtual machines is one of the ways that cloud service providers can take this from being our problem as a cloud service provider to your problem as a customer. However, if you think about the trends in clouds today, the idea is actually to reverse that. We should be taking away more of your problems than actually pushing them back onto you, which is why clouds going towards bare metal would actually be a good thing. The way we actually measured it inside the Linux kernel is just to use ftrace. Ftrace is, just tells you as a trace of everything that comes through the Linux kernel, how many functions are called, and you just multiply that by the bug density, which for the Linux kernel horizontal piece we assume to be uniform. It's not quite true. We, as a, I'm actually a driver developer for Linux. I've got to confess that about 80% of Linux's bugs do tend to be in drivers. The, the rest of the kernel only has about 20% of the bugs, but in my defense, I have to say that 80% of the Linux kernel is drivers. So on that measure, potentially, uh, perhaps we're all uniform. And obviously, the runtimes you can do this with are not just Nabler. It's Kata, Docker, Gvisor, anything. And these are the results. So this is looking at the uh, actual uh, footprint inside the kernel of all of this. And as you can see, the interesting thing is that Docker is not actually, you'd expect it to have the highest possible footprint. And I should also stress that this is Docker running an application. So the Docker here is not using all 300 system calls. That's why it's pretty low. What this is showing is that if you could get a perfect SecCom profile, which lots of people will claim can't be done, and if you claim that, I'll set Jessie Frizzell on you because she claims it can. But if you could do it, this is what the bounding sort of uh, horizontal attack profile of Docker would be. Right? So the point to make is that this is the bounding horizontal attack profile of Kata. Right? Um, these two are, again, not very different. If you talk to hypervisor people, they would usually tell you that a hypervisor, because it's only got about you know, 10 hypercalls and a container has 300 system calls, should be 30 times more secure than a container. That's not what these figures show, primarily because this Docker instance is not using all of the system calls, and there are actually reasons why hypervisors actually use much more of the kernel interface than they let on through the hypercalls. It's why any vulnerability in KVM is almost instantly a fatal vulnerability of containment in a hypervisor. So on the horizontal attack profile, the difference here is only around 20%, it's not, or 30%. It's not, not significantly, uh, I mean, on some of the tests where Docker uses more system calls, I mean, Kata always sits, sort of hides around this line. Primarily, it just depends how many uh, functions inside the hypercalls you're exciting, Docker actually bounces around pretty significantly depending on the number of system calls it uses in the test. The interesting thing on this is that pretty universally, Gvisor is, on some of its incarnations, higher than Docker. That means that technically, Gvisor is using more system calls than Docker is, which looks like a paradoxical result. How the hell is it doing this? And the reason is uh, Gvisor is implemented entirely on a Go runtime. And it turns out that the Go runtime is pretty profligate in the way it uses system calls. So as it's translating the kernel into Go, it's actually making more system calls than the system calls it translated. It's an interesting question as to whether the system calls it makes are exploitable or not, and we'll get into that. But right, right at the moment, just on the horizontal attack profile, Gvisor is actually more vulnerable than Docker. And obviously, since we tuned Nabla against this horizontal profile measure, so we have a, a lead on almost everybody doing this because we invented the measure, published it, but then we tuned our system to it, Nabla is sitting at about uh, half of what Kata does for most of the time. And the point is, that this is a pure container runtime with no virtualization that on the only known measure of security profiles is showing itself to be about 50% more secure than a hypervisor, which is the achievement we were looking for. Um, there's also one interesting thing that we have on our website, which is, um, uh, a while back, using the idea that you could actually look at what interfaces the system was using in the kernel, one of the things I said in IBM sort of intern was, okay, so 
Just saying that we can do this is one thing. Can you prove to me we can exploit it? So look at the way that Catter is using the interfaces and come up with an exploit based on an existing CVE. The point of basing it on an existing CVE is the exploit I show you only works in older kernels. Everybody has patched it now, so it wouldn't work on the public cloud you're taking it to. So I'm trying to be a, a good white hat citizen instead of a black hat. But the point is that it turns out the 9P interface in Catter is pretty much a handoff from the guest to the host. Any file system exploit I find in the host kernel can actually be exploited over the 9P interface in Kata. And so this exploit actually shows somebody firing up a binary running inside a virtual machine in Kata and then oopsing the host kernel primarily because it does it through a file system exploit. But this is a classic illustration of the problem of uh, Virtualization is an answer to your security, which is that unless you're very careful about the interfaces, you don't get as much security as you think you're getting because some of the things we do to get containers to run in virtual machines pokes holes straight through this virtual machine interface and makes you vulnerable again. And this is just an, an example of that. So we'll get on to a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, Ricardo can go first because it's his talk. Effectively, he wrote the slides. I, I'm not very good at this type of slide work. Uh, yeah, so in terms of uh, comparing Kata with Nabla, uh, you know, you have, uh, Kata has that VM isolation, and Nabla has a solo. Yep. We have no VM isolation whatsoever. We are a pure containerized system. We have something that was designed to run on a VM, but we stripped out all of the virtualization, and it runs container native now. And in Kata, uh, you can run all the system calls with no, no modification, because there's a Linux kernel. Uh, inside the VM. Right, and with, so Nabla is, some binaries cannot be run unmodified because you have to link with the unikernel. So if you're programming in a low level language like C, C++, you have to modify your binary before it will run inside a Nabla tender. However, if you're running something uh, webby that sits right at the top and has its own interpreter, we can just modify the interpreter and the code that you care about will run unmodified. So we do not have complete universality unlike Kata, which does. And uh, for Kata, we need the bare metal or nested virtualization and Nabla? Nabla, we just don't need any virtualization at all. So we run equally well either on bare metal or with nested virtualization just because we don't use any of the virtualization calls. Um, but again, as I said, I think the less virtualization you have, the better you are because the more responsible you're making your cloud service provider, which is a good thing in my book. With Kata, you have an established community. It's been around for over a year, and even longer if you count the years of uh, Clear Containers and Hyper.sh. Yeah, where, I mean, this is a research project. I'm not kidding you. You've been to many talks about doing this in production. I Probably as a research project, I should be able to tell you that obviously it's not in production. However, I know one person who is actually using Nabla in production, surprisingly enough. I didn't recommend they do it, and I won't name them and shame them here, but it, one person is actually running it in production. But obviously, ideally, this is still a, a cutting edge research project, not something you should be deploying on for everyday use. And with Kata, you can run any type of Linux workload. It's compatible out of the box with any type of yeah, workload uh, that, that you can run on Linux. Yeah, and Nabla, the tender is based on NetBSD, which means in theory we have a mismatch between Linux and NetBSD. But the job of this thing called Rump Run that you saw inside the Delta is actually to shim that difference. So effectively, any program that runs on Linux can be linked with the Nabla, ten, uh, with the Nabla uh, Rump Run runtime, run on the tender, and it should all work. But the key thing here is should. We have explored a lot of different applications, including things like the Go runtime, the Python runtime, so far, it all seems to work, but because we're based on NetBSD instead of Linux, at some point, you might expect to find a problem down that, around there. Cool. Let's talk about Kubernetes and how you can run these with Kubernetes, all of, both of these runtimes. So you can run it with either Cryo or ContainerD. Cryo support is not quite there yet, but it, it will be there uh, at some point. And you can use the runtime class in Kubernetes that became available in Kubernetes 112. Um, so Kata requirements, again, it's just, uh, we talked about that before. Bare metal, uh, nested virtualization. You can use key EMU or newly available in 1.4 and EMU, which is a faster uh, stripped down key EMU. Uh, 
Potentially, you can run it with firecrackers. They're both communities are uh, talking with each other, and uh, eventually the goal is to have Kata uh, run with firecracker. And with Nabla, you either bare metal or a virtual machine. So anything, uh, so it can run in any any nest environment. Uh, so let's talk about the runtime class. Uh, this is what I, what I call the EC2 of Kubernetes, just because in in. Uh, just because in EC, uh, EC2 you have all kinds of different um, instance types, so with the runtime class you can run all kinds of different runtime classes, right? So uh, you can mix and match in the types of workloads that you can uh, mix in your cluster, uh, depending on the type of uh, runtime that you're using. So what is it? Is it uh, you can run different runtimes in Kubernetes, uh, uh, available in Kubernetes 112. And you need to enable that feature gate, install that customer source definition in Kubernetes. Uh, you need to configure container D on the CRI, and then uh, you need to sp specify that runtime class name in the pod when you instantiate it. So this is what it looks like, running uh, a runtime class uh, specification. Uh, it's just a single string. And you need that runtime handler, uh, which is another string that gets configured at the CRI level uh, in container D or cryo. And then when you want to run your pod, you specify a string, and uh, in, in this could be something like Kata uh, runtime or Nabla runtime. And then with the container D configuration, you specify the, uh, again, the string, which is a CRI configuration, and then the binary of the runtime that you want to use. So there's a feature in the works in SIGNode uh, that will allow you to identify the runtimes automatically on the node. So as soon as a kubelet boots up and register, registers with the uh, kube API server, it will tell it you know, what kind of runtimes are available on that node, and they will be available in Kubernetes by the time you issue like a command, uh, like a kubectl, uh, kubectl get runtime command, uh, and then you get the list of runtimes. So briefly, workloads that you can run with these runtimes. Uh, anything goes, so user going through a load balancer, it's just an example of Istio and uh, running with Envoy proxy and in Kubernetes. Uh, other types of uh, workloads, APIs, credential store, databases, uh, applications for big data and analytics. An example of running microservices, this is a microservice with a backend uh, using a database and uh, Kubernetes uh, using a Kubernetes ingress. Uh, credential store, this is an opposite of what type of workload you would think you would run in these types of runtimes uh, because they're not necessarily untrusted. It's more like a trusted workload, but it also goes with these if you want to keep your workloads isolated where you want to have a user come through TLS and then in the back end, uh, your services going through TLS as well uh, through, uh, to, to a data store that can be anything like uh, Cassandra data, uh, data store, etcd, or Amazon S3. An example of relational databases also can be run with uh, something like Kubernetes and uh, any of these runtimes. And a brief word on multi-tenancy. So, um, so this, these runtimes will allow you to run in a cluster, uh, having maybe two namespaces for different tenants and uh, in an isolated way, so in a single cluster, so allowing you to have that isolation across the board. So briefly, a demo. Uh, so we'll show you Kata and Nabla runtimes to running together with Kubernetes, the runtime class, and I'll show you that both runtimes are running. So we have five minutes or something. Should we go two? So I have um, two definitions here for a, a pod in Kata, and it specifies the runtime class Kata runtime here. And I also have a pod in Nabla and it specifies um, Nabla runtime here. So these are pre-configured ahead of time to run in, a, uh, in, in, in the CRI, in, our, in, in a Kubernetes cluster running in GCP, and this GCP cluster has uh, nested virtualization enabled. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply these. And I'm gonna do kubectl get pods. And you see the containers are being created. You see the Nabla container got created. This is Nabla node.js uh, base container. And to show you that, 
Nabla is running. I will sh show the logs. And you can see the solo glue actually booted, booted up here. And then it's actually listening on port 8080. And then for Kata containers, I have to SSH to, I'm going to go ahead and SSH to each one of my Kubernetes nodes and run a Kata runtime list command. And then and one of the nodes, these, uh, uh, this pod is running, and it will show you that the containers are there for Kata. So that's SSH into, oh, so they're, they're my Kata runtime pods. So yeah, so this is a runtime class, and uh, you can run both runtimes together uh, on a single cluster. Pretty cool stuff. So there's talk about implementing maybe more capabilities in the runtime class that I will specify. Maybe uh, Nabla has some certain capabilities and Kata has some other certain capabilities uh, and so that people can choose uh, which one they want to use. And in other runtimes like Gvisor or any new, newer runtimes that uh, get created. Uh, so go back here. Uh. So the future for some of these runtimes. So um, in terms of uh, hypervisors maybe support for Kata and others like Xen, VMware, and Hyper-V, and maybe in the public cloud, supporting nested virtualization in AWS, which is not supported now, uh, bare metal offerings in, GC, in Google Cloud and Azure, and possibly uh, support on the Kubernetes engines for, from all these cloud providers. And also Firecracker support in Kata containers. So like I mentioned before, both communities are getting together and trying to make uh, uh, Kata work with Firecracker. Uh, and then more features in terms of hub plug support uh, for networking and CPUs. Uh, and no. then the Nabla containers. Um, obviously, the thing that we come to the, here for is Kubernetes integration. Run and C is OK, but we, it could be better. Obviously, we need better universality if you want to run C applications, although I'm not sure we can get there. We need lots of public cloud support. Um, we need more tooling around the images if you want to create your own Rumper on images instead of using our preset ones. Even if you're building things like Python and Node.js, sometimes you actually want to tune the Python and Node.js interpreters for the runtime environment. And obviously, buildless and serverless are two applications we're looking at Nabla. And then the AIX use case that I, I didn't actually put in here is obviously you can use Nabla to bring containers to operating systems which didn't previously had it, have it, because everything that sits inside Nabla is actually fully containerized. And if it will run on anything with those seven system calls, it's actually a ready-made, prepackaged, portable container runtime for even operating systems that haven't even heard of containers. And the main thing that we're looking at in the future is one of the problems with Nabla, if you actually look at what's going on, is that we're emulating most of the system calls. So effectively, we're committing the hypervisor fault because any system call we emulate, we've pushed up into the layer that you effectively own as the person who's renting this instance. The ideal would be to try and actually push more back to the cloud service provider, so make them responsible for the tender and Solo 5 and everything, which we can do. But one of the things we're actually going to be looking at is two different things. One is the idea of a horizontal attack profile where the actual measurement is a number of bugs traversed, a number of lines of code traversed multiplied by bug density is not quite right. Because if you look at the CVE sprinkling throughout Linux, some system calls are much more vulnerable on CVEs than others. And this means that some interfaces are actually much safer than others. One of the things we actually need to do to refine the horizontal attack profile is to multiply by safety of the interface, which will give us a much more accurate number. And then from my point of view as a kernel engineer, much more interesting is asking the question, these system calls that sit inside the Linux kernel, right at the moment, they're unsafe on a horizontal attack profile because the kernel runs in the same address space. Any escape from that system call compromises the entire kernel and therefore the entire system. One thing that's interesting to look at from an operating system point of view is, could we actually run the Linux kernel in multiple address spaces? for multiple different things that we're using it. Because if I were actually running in a, an address space that was different from but allied to the actual process runtime, 
for my system call, I could still compromise that system call, break out, but the only thing I get access to is the thing I've already compromised anyway, which is the container. I can't actually break horizontally into another container. So effectively, it allows you to run proper Linux kernel system calls in a safe environment. And this is one of the things we'll actually be looking at as future looking research later. And obviously, we have lots of future workloads for everything. We're running out of time, so we'll skip over them. Um, we are looking at doing this on serverless for both of us. Firecracker is the sort of uh, thing for him. And actually, Firecracker is useful for me because the serverless people a year ago when I showed them Nabla and IBM told me to go away. Now, suddenly, they've come back to me and are interested in whether we have an answer for Firecracker or not. It's amazing what marketing does. These are some of the resources. They'll be online in the slides. And with that, we'd like to say thank you and call for questions if you have any. So I know we're over time, but OK. So the question is, have we tried running Docker inside Nablo? The answer is yes, and it doesn't really work very well. Uh, the reason it doesn't work very well is because the Go, Go runtime was not very. The, the problem with Docker is that it claims to be written in Go, which is an easy language to put a tender under. But the big problem is it makes lots of system calls outside of the Go environment using that Go system call thing, and they are much harder to poke through, things like namespace creation, for instance. So what we think we can do is the compromise is we can't really get Docker running, but we can get things like the process of Kubernetes, the kubelet and things we might actually be able to get them running in Nabla using proxies, which as I told you are dangerous, but it should be possible. Okay, okay, one more question, but this will be the last one. The question is, uh, Kata is using KUMU, and what's the reason why it's using KUMU? Uh, I believe it for historical reasons. Uh, so there is uh, uh, NEMU support in 1.4, which is a stripped down KUMU, uh, so you can make use of that. And again, like I mentioned, we're working with the Firecracker community that will allow us to run you know, uh, Kata with Firecracker. So Firecracker is a stripped down BMM uh, that has just whatever three three devices yeah so very lightweight okay and with that we need to let you get to lunch so the good guys can tidy up the hall thank you very much thank you oh, sorry dinner yeah.